Well, hello, that's me again. Today is August 1st, and let's kind of do a little bit of the seat wrap here and there, hodgepodge if you wish. And I will start with the problem which uh, many people really uh, kind of begin to bother me in uh, many uh, respects, and not that they don't have the point, but there are so, so many uh, twists and turns to this point of losses of the armed forces of Ukraine, that it is really difficult to uh, explain it in one go, when, for example, you uh, type your answer or response in the discussion forums, granted that once there are uh, all kinds of events begin to happen with uh, armed forces of Ukraine, that means they are being annihilated in the industrial quantities, you suddenly have, as always, spike of the, all those um, uh, trolls from the center of the uh, psychological operations in Ukraine, and they're just basically rara boys who just cannot stand it, you know, and so you, they constantly bring up this point, and again, funny enough, uh, it has to be explained. And let me start with this. Here is we have the uh, Mr. Uh, Shaigu uh, explaining the uh, number of the losses, uh, basically in um, the July months of July, and he talks about that Kiev lost nearly 21,000 troops, and uh, he actually this nearly 21,000 troops is uh, 20,824. And here we have, speaking at a conference attended by senior military commander, Shoigu noted that uh, Kiev is desperately throwing new forces in a bid to storm of our positions, but the Russian military thwart all breakthrough attempts by relying on, obviously we know, it's uh, very, very good hardware, recon, things of this nature. And here what he makes when he makes a summary. As a result, in July, July Ukraine lost 20,284 service members and 2,027 units of military equipment, including 10 German supplied Leopard tanks, 11 US made bread, infantry fighting vehicles, 50 self propelled guns from several Western countries. And according to Shaigu, on July 26 and 27 alone, Ukraine lost more, more than 400 service members and 31 tanks and other heavy weaponry near the uh, settlement of Robotina in Russia's Zaporozhye region. Last week, a video surfaced on social media pur purporting to show a graveyard of uh, Bradley filmed at the same location. And here he also concludes that the Kyiv regime, with the support of its Western sponsors, is now focused on carrying out terrorist attacks on civilian infrastructure. We're going to be talking about those ter that terrorism a little bit uh, later in this video, but let me explain what uh, losses he is talking about. And the question is, are those all killed? Well, let me put it this way. Russian Ministry of Defense is extremely conservative in terms of the, uh, actually counting the uh, KIAs killed in action and uh, those who are to come as the casualties or losses in general, which include usually KIAs, wounded in action, missing in action, and what have you. But there is one issue which people have to keep in mind. Russians give only numbers they can count on. As my friends who are actually on the front lines in, uh, uh, um, in Donbass, and they specifically state, you can count those only in the open and o not always sometimes. There is a whole issue of uh, armed forces of Ukraine using provocations when actually Russians allow them to remove their killed from the battlefield. What they do, they throw in there instead of people who collect uh, 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 killed and wounded sometimes, they throw in those diversionary uh, groups which actually conduct the offensive operations. Of course, they are being annihilated, but Tells, that tells you pretty much everything you need to know about the character of the Kiev regime and people who command it. It's mostly people from Washington. No honor, no anything. So, and then again, what do you expect from them? We're also going to talk about it. But the point is that this is just in the open. As you probably uh, can observe yourself when you look at the 
landscapes or terrain of the theater of operations. Much of it is uh, in the wooded areas, including those hedges, so to speak, you know. Uh, um, and when you look at this, those small uh, stripes of forest, much of its uh, uh, trenches uh, for the armed forces of Ukraine are within those stri strips, so to speak, of the uh, all kinds of trees. And Russians cannot count what is going on there, but Russians know that there are obviously those trenches and they've been attacked relentlessly. And the huge number of casualties and KIAs and wounded is happening there. And that is why, for example, when Colonel uh, McGregor, for example, and other people who actually have their connections and their own inside uh, uh, sources, so to speak, within the Pentagon or CIA or what have you, and they come out and say, yeah, you know what, by now we have at least 350,000 killed. And uh, this is also very, very conservative estimate. And when you look at it in the overall picture, and especially the way now Kiev regime uh, basically exhumes the bodies of uh, KIAs and tries to uh, actually free more than 100 hectares, uh, you can uh, trans uh, basically convert it to the um, acres on your own just to uh, basically bury all those uh, you know killed it gives you the idea and fact is even those numbers of 350,000 killed are very conservative I am on record and I know how to defend it and I know what uh, assumptions could be done here including the well uh, gross probability, so to speak, very inaccurate uh, probability of the reliability, so to speak, of the sources. But we are talking about in excess of one million casualties for the armed forces of Ukraine. And these are including, obviously, KIAs. We don't know the whole number. It could be actually right now up in excess of half a million, which probably a very reasonable number. And wounded and then there is this huge issue hundreds of thousands of missing in action which of course they are not missing in action they are probably killed and the Kiev regime and its handlers from Washington and London they just want to hide this horrifying fact of the war crime they committed they committed against Russia obviously and they committed against the Ukraine not that at this stage any most Russians don't care how many are killed there the issue of the, um, so to speak, brotherly relations between the Russians and Ukrainians, so to speak, is the whole other story. And I'm not going to go deep here into the psychology and psychiatric issues of what is today, uh, what happens today with the population uh, of the of the what the country used to be called Ukraine. When we know that basically not only uh, it uh, Vladimir Putin basically gave the green light because everybody knows that Russia does doesn't need that population for Poland to get those uh, Eastern Kresy lands, which are primarily parts of the Western Ukraine. But we also have the issue of Hungary there. If you look attentively at the map and you will understand why Hungary and those several hundred thousand of their native Hungarians in Ukraine or what used to be Ukraine are really uh, anxious to get back to their homeland. And that is partition of Ukraine. But that also brings us uh, to the issue of a complete, complete garbage which is happening in terms of the what it, uh, people say. Oh, it's uh, basically they get... Uh, uh, Russia gets the war uh, uh, on its own soil. Russia got that war on its own soil since I don't know when, since the start of special military operations. And here's uh, uh, Mr. Patrushev, uh, Nikolai Patrushev, the Secretary of the Security Council of Russia Federation, speaking yesterday at Izmestia. He called the uh, uh, United States and its allies the sponsor of terrorism, terrorism because there is a terrorist activity on uh, in Russia sponsored by 
by Washington. And this is a serious, uh, really, uh, accusation, but everybody knows that uh, basically terrorism is the weapon of the weak. And uh, combined West with its leader, United States, are weak parties. Militarily, they are actually, you can say, they're primarily impotent. And this is uh, helpless rage is what drives today Biden administration and trying and uh, inspire all kinds of terrorist acts against Russian civilians. And again, I am on the record. Most people in a Biden administration, they uh, hate Russian gods. I mean, especially people around DNC, they are absolutely abhor Russian race. They abhor Slavs. They consider uh, us, for example, I'm Russian, so untermensch, and so we probably do not deserve to live on this, uh, you know, on the face of the earth. And this is what, for example, their policies uh, build around. It's not only the some geopolitical uh, interest, which they cannot formulate anyway. They simply do not have the uh, capability, I mean, uh, be that educational background to do this. But that's what it is. That, I mean, fanatical Russophobia drives those so-called decisions. And decisions, though, those decisions, they all result in this. You know, like Ministry of Defense of Russian Federation today says that, again, there are three UAVs, uh, you know, have been trying to attack uh, Moscow in Moscow district. Two Ukrainian UAVs have been uh, shot down in the, um, of the territory over the Azinsovsky and Narofaminsk regions of the Moscow district or oblast. And another uh, uh, UAV have been um, suppressed by the electronic uh, warfare means and it slammed itself out while flying, um, you know, being uh, during the fall. Here it is. It hit uh, as the cold. Yeah, that's terrorist strikes. And this is what essentially Kremlin says that these are the acts of desperation. And this is this, the helpless rage. And uh, they also explain Mr. Peskov, whom I do not like. Actually, many people do not like Mr. Peskov. But here you cannot uh, disagree with him because he says that Kiev regime isn't achieving any success. It's obvious that the counteroffensive isn't going as planned. And these are the acts of desperation. And yes, this is terrorism. There are all many reported cases, for example, when Ukrainian uh, nationals, uh, ethnically and, you know, just in spirit, I would say, uh, who have been recruited by SBU, which is, of course, basically the CIA's and MI6 outlet in uh, Kiev, uh, for example, to derail their passenger trains. So that's normal thing. So yeah, in Washington, just they think it's normal. I mean, that's probably what they do. not probably. It's hundred percent guarantee. This is what they are preaching to their uh, basically studios in Kiev. Uh, and yeah, they will be killing uh, civilian people, children, women. I mean, that's what they do. Because and if you look attentively at uh, how United States persecutes uh, prosecutes its wars, you can take a look in Vietnam. You have millions of the civilians being basically bombed into to. The the smithereens with the millions of civilians killed. The same goes for Iraq, and we go on and on and on. They just bomb civilians. This is the only thing they know how to do. They don't know how to fight real warfare, and as a result, they actually are reduced to things of this nature. Or, for example, as uh, you already know, the Skripal affair with the poor Skripal cat, which have been basically burned alive. I mean, this is what they do. So, but of course they try their all kinds of their uh, um, uh, other uh, real kind of military uh, action, so to speak. And here we have RIA News, which reports on yesterday that, again, uh, armed forces of Ukraine yesterday tried to actually attack uh, with their uh, surface UAVs, they are British essentially, uh, the uh, two uh, ships of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, which conduct uh, the patrol um, operations in the western part of the uh, Black Sea. And here's the, um, basically the English report of this, and the Russian Navy rebuffs Ukrainian drone attack, as Ministry of the Defense uh, reports. And what are those two ships? So the 
although Ukrainian UNVs have been blown out of the water literally uh, in the distances of 1,800 meters from those uh, two patrol ships of the uh, uh, court of uh, uh, project 22160 uh, which are um, really kind of Russian attempt on their uh, American if you wish littoral combat ship these are around 1700 tons of displacement ships which have been done so to speak in their uh, uh, modular design it uh, they carry those you know uh, basic equipment such as the uh, uh, gun it's a decent gun i believe they're 76 millimeter but I, I believe then later they started to put the 100 millimeter gun and then they have all kinds of the machine guns they have all kinds of the satellite communications good radar good comms all in all it's a good patrol ship which is capable to uh, conduct the patrolling of the sea lines of communication this is what they do now to make sure that no uh, uh, jerk tries to sneak uh, any kind of weapons on the or ammunition into the into to Ukraine throughout their support which is being demolished as we speak uh, but of course they because of the modular design they uh, have their capability to uh, uh, get their uh, good old calibers in containers there and then they become a very serious strike force Russia has six of them or rather it has uh, three or four already active and of course the other two are being built and this will be the series of six after that Russia stops uh, manufacturing them but you know all those guys will be primarily serving in the at the Black Sea Fleet of Russia in, uh, with the base in Sevastopol and Novorossiysk and these are good patrol ships as I already stated which can be uh, really improved and uh, uh, have their firepower grow exponentially once the containers with which are coming of the with the calibers uh, will be installed on them and then they become uh, keep, they will be capable to control pretty much all Black Sea and some parts of the Eastern Mediterranean. And that's what they try. They try to attack those ships and obviously well, by now Russians are pretty good at shooting down or sh blowing out of the water any kind of their uh, uh, means so to speak be them UAVs or whatever the ship maybe they try to use out of the water in the Black Sea, in the Black sea. and so that's resulted pretty much with the same uh, outcome as it was before those UAVs have been destroyed but they will continue to do so and Russians will continue to blow whatever the uh, that traditional hiding behind civilians uh, um, uh, installations they will be trying to reorganize in uh, what's left in Ukraine and uh, Russians will continue to blow them with blow up with the, all kinds of cruise missiles and drones so until it stops and until for example London which loves to point out how powerful they are until they will simply run out of those of that equipment and they will run out of it but that brings us also to the other thing and this is uh, uh, you can go actually and <clears throat> look up a wonderful uh, moon of Alabama, uh, Alabama block where he uh, Bernard uh, who himself a former uh, Bundeswehr officer he actually destroys all this baloney which is of course the Western media trying to uh, spread over the ears of uh, their uh, brainwashed Western public is the issue of the Staromayor and again you look at this it's yesterday it's CNN uh, grudgingly admits nowhere to hide the question troubling Ukrainian troops I mean the grinding counteroffensive yeah grinding for armed forces of Ukraine and they talk about this again uh, uh, Western media just completely pull it out out uh, pull this out of their ass and designate some garbage uh, some basically destroyed Hamlet and Stara uh, Majorska is the hamlet of around 200 houses which are completely destroyed so basically it's the sp geographic spot on the ground and they they say that its fate represents of this Stara Majorska a larger problem for Ukraine as it pushes forward after the bitter battles of Ukraine advances barely a wall is left standing from which Kiev forces can defend the recaptured ground first they de didn't recapture anything because uh, they basically go into this uh, empty space shell they get obliterated 
thrown out, Russians pull back again and wait them to come in into this Staromayorsk. So they basically, they do not have possession of this uh, actually Hamlet, but they need to report any kind of the success. And if they basically lie about successes, this is what the, it's modus operandi of the Western journals and Western uh, media. They lie. It's they lie for living, basically. Their owner is lying. And so, and they begin to create this garbage that somehow it has a symbolic uh, uh, meaning. It doesn't. I mean, this is another Hamlet where Russians just absolutely, they just not grinding. It's basically annihilating in industrial quantities, whatever Ukraine throws in, because they cannot stop this slaughter until they completely run out of this. Well, you can also say that the uh, uh, <clears throat> mobilizational potential, which already they are running uh, out of, and of course Western media, they do not really want to recognize the fact that when you look at the uh, actually POWs which Russia collects from whatever is left from the armed forces of Ukraine, you see primarily old people now. Well, I'm being 60, so it's kind of, yeah, well, I'm not the battlefield material anymore, but there are guys like me and some actually older than me, who are being thrown into the battle. They've been basically snatched from the streets, you know, away from their families. And you can also easily see what happens in terms of people who are mentally sick, who are mentally disabled. They also want to enroll them, so to speak, or enlist them into whatever is left there. The only force uh, Ukraine has right now, it's primarily, <clears throat> and the force which more or less equipped with something, and it's not as old and it's not as incapable as the force some people <clears throat> Uh, estimated as uh, around 300,000. It's spread around Kiev, obviously, some of it at Kharkov, and who knows where else, you know. So, and that's the only force they have left, which has some kind of remedial, so to speak, uh, capability to fight and uh, uh, basically resist. But Russians, I mean, satisfied with their modus operandi right now, although many people still do not want to know that Russians are advancing and quite significantly around Kupiansk and towards Kharkov. But of course, yeah, don't expect Western media to report on that. And uh, that brings us to this uh, other thing, which is um, how to put it. I don't even know how to approach it. I don't know what TED is. Uh, I know that's kind of popular platform or you channel on the YouTube and millions of people subscribe and some people go there and talk and even play music or something like that. But um, uh, I stumbled uh, um, a few days ago on this guy who was speaking to this TED forum or whatever it is. And the name of the guy is, uh, <clears throat> he, m months ago he spoke to this TED platform, and his name is Jan Bremer. Uh, the guy has degree in international relations and PhD in political science. That means he has no education, which is uh, useful in any sense. But the guy was talking about the next global superpower isn't what you think it is. And the guy runs some uh, company which uh, uh, provides some shyster uh, services like, you know, the uh, risk assessment and things of this nature. And when you look at this, and the guy was talking about for uh, 15 minutes, and he was talking to this office plankton, which is the guys who primarily do their... Uh, coding, nothing wrong with coding, make no mistake. Software engineers, for example, are, are, are absolutely crucial and important profession, and we wouldn't be able to live without them. But the problem, of course, the guy <clears throat> came out and in the manner of uh, Steve Jobs, late Steve Jobs, not that I liked it, it's basically a baloney, it's the uh, performance, it's the uh, entertainment, he started to uh, basically poor the buzzwords such as like artificial intelligence, global economy, to all those idiots who sit there and who primarily never encountered in their lives any kind of the real economy, the same as Mr. Jan Bremer, who would know the difference between CNC machines, for example, and doesn't understand that what that all this uh, artificial intelligence thing, I, I would call it in quotes, and all 
all other those buzzwords of the global economy which doesn't exist anymore as such and we obviously do not have any global superpower left and believe me I can uh, I'm writing the book of why there will be no single global superpower but obviously Mr. Bremer graduating all those uh, whatever the degree meals they graduate from <coughs> to get some kind of degree because they cannot, don't understand what differential equations are <coughs> and what physics is but um, you get this guy and they really eat this garbage which he talks to them and when you look at this you begin to understand the fundamental problem not only with the media the fourth estate which is in for example uh, uh western world is utterly corrupt i mean make no mistake there are many corrupted media in russia too this is not to say that russians are you know s sit here you know pretty no they don't i mean this is a tragedy we have people as i already stated many times with zero backgrounds with zero understanding of anything serious in their lives you know rushing uh, you know to the to the trough of all those uh, that monetization and those grants and payouts which they sell all kinds of trash I mean which is not it's uh, utterly uns unscientific and Mr. Bremer is like that and he was trying to explain to guys what global economy is when it already doesn't exist as such and that we have the already uh, fate are complete. It's a de facto multipolar world. For now, this multipolar world is about two poles. It's primarily United States and a bunch of the allies, or so to speak, well, actually not allies, colonies in the <clears throat> Western Europe. <clears throat> and of course, it's Russia and China, namely in this order because obviously superpower dome without the ba balance of power there's nothing to talk about bring me any professor of the political science from ivy league or from anywhere else and let's talk about they will not t talk to me about it because they are afraid they will be will have the floor wiped out with them because those people they think because they have uh, the ability to juggle or juxtaposition couple of the pseudo intellectual constructs they can talk about geo politics and they can talk about superpowerdom they can't without serious military engineering degree and military and uh, intelligence background you cannot talk about it because you need to constantly describe the balance of power and it is very difficult to uh, explain to this office plankton which has which is being graduated in all kinds of those uh, you know Ivy League or Sorbonne or those Oxfords with all those degrees in nothing literally nothing and they uh, how to explain to them that how the extraction industry for example which is based on geology and very advanced extraction technology actually projects itself in the production of the real means of production ranging from this fundamental material like, like steel and energy to obviously machining complexes to means of transportation and uh, which end up with the combat uh, combat aviation combat systems and extremely advanced electronics for them their limit their horizon is the iphone and this is what is the tragedy of this we have literally this whole class of people the whole generation of them of office plankton who are good nothing but moving or pushing papers on some desk and playing games uh, on the computer uh, we have literally those people in charge and this is the civilization tragedy and here is what I wanted to point out to you that uh, when you sp when you uh, if you recall I spoke about it in the last video and this was Mr. Mishustin Prime Minister of Russia saying we need immediately 16,000 engineers now not software designers make no mistake I and again software design is extremely important uh, and in some fundamental sense a productive part but I mean they don't need all those uh, you know scripters of games or anything they need people who know what engineering is ranging from the material uh, materials to machine building things and uh, you know quality engineers and things of that nature and no they don't need those people in deg with degrees in political science they are useless 
And then, as Michael Hudson, uh, ironically, with his brilliant mind, saying that basically only thing which we have, you know, uh, after we graduated as economists, was either to go back to teaching basically spreading out or uh, elaborating and expanding basically this fundamentalist uh, garbage which they uh, teach in the West as economics or go to, you know, uh, so say somewhere working in the Wall Street or in some banks at best. And so, but yes, this is what we have. And when you look at this, this is how they lie. This is how they try to cover up the, the catastrophe. The, the catastrophe is already happened. It's just the matter of how it's going to be arranged and how it's going to be presented as the fait accompli for primarily ignorant Western public. Uh, we have these people, they are not capable to change anything, they are not capable to make their life choices proper, some of them, but majority of them is, is not. That is why they called office plankton, and they will continue to invest in whatever is modern, uh, uh, you know, uh, fashionable to invest today, which is, of course, speculate some electric vehicle which nobody needs anymore so what what do they want to a new new tesla new iphone new what have you new i mean garbage which produces basically nothing and uh, provides no improvement of the lives of the billions of people around the world which of course are based primarily on agriculture which is to eat, to have enough food, enough bread and milk and eggs on their tables, to have normal mode of transportation, ranging from either rolling stock, you know, you know to good buses, to affordable cars, and of, of course have the good uh, medical care. I mean, good uh, medical technology. When you look at this, these are all productive fields. You need to have a fundamental understanding of them. And when some guy with the uh, with absolute zero experience regarding anything, let alone the main driver behind history and behind modern geopolitics, which is, well, always was actually, balance of power, which is based on the real economic and military might. How can you even explain it? They don't have the toolkit. Fact is, most of them, they don't have the brain to understand that. And that is why they constantly go out and use all those useless indices, the statistics, which is cooking books, basically. All American or Western economic statistics is uh, books cooking. And then they go and preach to the same ignoramuses as they are about what is the next global superpower will be. And this is what I wanted to tell you today because it was important to give you a degree, so to speak, of seat wrap and uh, kind of give you the primer for the upcoming months. And as always, guys, those who like what I do, please subscribe to my channel. And those who can afford, please support me on Patreon or buy me a coffee and too. And have a nice week. And I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.